And the purpose of this video is to address some questions and misunderstandings that have arisen um, in the Facebook group mainly, also on the YouTube channel, about the ego. Now, when I say misunderstandings, I only mean relative to the Indian tradition, relative to the yogic tradition, and specifically the tradition of tantric yoga. So I don't mean to say that um, these are misunderstandings in any absolute sense, meaning uh, I don't mean to make anyone wrong in terms of how they define the ego. I just want to clarify what this term means in yoga philosophy particularly, and then talk about why it's important. So please lay aside anything that you've heard about the ego from uh, Western psychology, from uh, you know, Freudian um, teachings, from Jungian teachings. Again, not to say that those teachings don't have value. Um, for many people, they do have quite a lot of value. But you need to lay them aside to really grasp what is meant by ego in the yogic sense of that word. So when we say yogic sense, of course, we're talking about terminology in the Sanskrit language. So what's the term here in Sanskrit? It's called ahankara. Ahankara from two, it's a, it's a kind of compound from two words, aham, I, and kara, maker or manufacturer. So ahankara literally means self-image manufacturer. Even more literally, it's I maker, but here, as we can tell from just um, reading primary sources in yoga philosophy, uh, it really means self-image manufacturer. So the hankara then is simply the aspect of mind, the aspect of chitta that generates self-images that are then believed by all except <laughs> awakened, liberated beings. And of course, if you're in the process of awakening, sometimes you believe your self-image thoughts and sometimes you don't. And there can come a point, and there does come a point where you no longer believe those self-image thoughts, and we'll come to that. But the important thing here is that from the yogic point of view, the ego is nothing but a persistent conglomeration of thoughts about oneself that are believed, okay? So I can't stress this strongly enough because I'm, what I'm seeing recently, especially in sort of more neo-tantric circles and circles that overlap with neo-tantra, that the ego is getting defined as the means by which one interfaces with, the, with society, with um, other humans. and Again, maybe this is the definition of ego in some other <laughs> disciplines or some other paths that I'm not aware of. Um, but this definition does not apply in terms of yoga traditions. So really speaking, the ego from the yogi point of view is that which interposes itself and gets in the way oftentimes of deep connection with other humans. So it's almost the opposite of that which allows us to interface <laughs> with other humans as uh, the ego is getting defined in, in some of these spiritual circles. Um, so again, all I can say is what's true vis-a-vis -vis the yoga tradition. So let's define it even more precisely. The ego then is primarily a verb, not a noun, meaning to say it's a functional capacity on the part of mind to generate self-images. And then if those self-images get believed, they can become persistent. But even then, the ego is not actually a thing. It's not actually a static entity. It's rather self-images that are persistently um, refreshed, as it were, uh, or, or, or maintained, right? So it takes mental, emotional energy. It takes prana shakti to actually maintain one's self-images. So it's an energy drain. The more free you are of self-images, the less uh, prana shakti gets devoured. 
by the ego, right? Because again, ego is fundamentally a verb, not a noun. So there's this process of um, generating self-images and then maintaining them. So if we define the ego as a noun, just, just as a figure of speech or a convenient way of talking, then it would be like a raft of a bunch of interrelated self-images bound together with the rope and glue of some skadas. That is to say, impressions of unresolved past experiences that are emotionally charged. Okay, so our samskaras are really the glue that hold these self images into a, a kind of interrelated conglomeration of thoughts about oneself. So, what are self images? Let's, that, that part needs to be more clear. Self images are simply any thought that you have about yourself, whether simple or complex, because sometimes the thoughts we have about ourselves are related to a whole bunch of kind of complex assumptions that abide primarily in the subconscious. So basically, anything that you would put after the words I am constitutes or refers to a self-image. Literally anything, you know. I am a man. I am a woman. I am neither. I am a, a yoga teacher. I am a scholar. I am a tantrika. Anything that you could put after the words I am, anything that you do put after those words, whether you speak it out loud or not, that's a self-image, right? That's a concept of yourself. Okay, so obviously, I hope it's clear, you can be um, teaching yoga with, with or without a self-image or concept of I am a yoga teacher. So why would we, why would it be a concern to have this self-image or concept? Because the concept is, is inevitably informed by cultural conditioning. It's freighted with the baggage of cultural conditioning. That's why we, in, in this tradition, regard it as a vikalpa if you say, I'm a man or I'm a woman. Because we are not using those terms in, in social discourse, we're not using those terms to refer to um, the biological status of our reproductive gametes. We're actually using those terms to refer to, whether we realize it or not, a whole bunch of assumptions about what it means to be a man or a woman or anything else that you say, I am blank, you know. So that's, that's uh, part of the problem. So when it comes to, you know, I am a mother, I am a yoga teacher. buried sort of like like a whole bunch of subconscious tags you know there's all these concepts about what it means to be a mother or yoga teacher or whatever else that is to say there's a lot of unexamined assumptions that come from our cultural conditioning about about what it means to be a mother or yoga teacher or whatever else and what a good one is supposed to look like and what a bad one looks like right and not to say there's no truth to, to those thoughts at all, but they're largely unexamined pieces of cultural programming that um, are sort of, you know, again, largely subconsciously tagged onto the self-image concept of I am whatever it is. Okay, take a breath and contemplate that while I plug in the computer so that uh, the battery doesn't die. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> yes, it's amateur hour with Harish. Okay, so those who are currently defining, and again, I don't know where they're getting this from, but you know, presumably some teacher or tradition that um, in that tradition legitimately says in the context of those teachings, oh, this is what the ego is. It's, some, it's an interface by which we relate to the world. And in the context of those teachings, again, wherever they're coming from, 
uh, people say, if we were to lose the ego, if we were to annihilate the ego, if we were to eliminate the ego, how in the world could we function in society? How could we do anything? How could we relate to others? So from a yogic point of view, this objection just makes no sense, okay? Because anything that's natural to you, any action or behavior or pattern of behavior that's natural to you doesn't require a self-image as support. Meaning to say, for example, um, anyone could be a mother, could mother her children without a self-image of what that is supposed to look like, um, or what a good mother looks like, what a bad mother looks like, just like all the other mammals do, right? Mammals mother their children without um, self-images because they don't have language, they don't have um, uh, vikalpas, you know, and we do. So the idea here, the, not the idea, the teaching is, whatever the example, I am blank, right? That if you don't have a culturally conditioned self-image of what that is supposed to look like, then number one, you're not constantly beating yourself up for failing to live up to that culturally conditioned self-image. And number two, you can be more sensitive to what is actually called for moment to moment in reality, because instead of referencing your mental image of what this role is supposed to look like, you're actually referencing the real life interactivity and relationships that continue to um, inform and deepen your sense of that role. So for example, being a, being a yoga teacher or anything, you know, almost all the roles that humans inhabit ha have to do with interaction with other humans, right? So, so imagine if your reference point was not a self-referencing, but a relational referencing where you're constantly connecting to reality, whatever's presenting itself moment to moment, and organically responding to what uh, your, best, your best guess at what seems called for, your best intuition at what seems called for in that reality moment to moment, instead of going into your mind and self-referencing vis-a-vis uh, -vis the mental image of that role, which is uh, informed by cultural conditioning. Not that conditioning is always wrong or bad, no, not at all, but it is a mental construct. So, being increasingly free of ego means being increasingly free of self-referencing, the act of self-referencing. Um, and there's more to it than that. This is an incredibly deep and subtle topic, of course. But what I'm trying to um, explicate here is that um, the ego is like, you know, it, since it's not one thing, since it's a raft of interrelated self-images, certain self-images can break off and fall away and others can still be there. So it, what we're talking about is not a process of ego annihilation so much where it's all goes kablooey all at once, although that can happen on very rare occasions and it's usually um, very shocking or disturbing to those to whom it does happen. But for most of us, it's not a process of ego annihilation, it's a process of ego attrition, where attrition means the gradual wearing away of something. So pieces of that self-image uh, construct sort of fall off and dissolve. And so you can have less and less and less ego, and most people do have less and less uh, on the spiritual path of awakening, all the way up until there's none. So no ego at all means that there are no self-images left. There are, there are no um, thoughts about oneself that one believes in, tries to justify, tries to defend. Um, there's just being. And being can manifest in, in, in action, right? So somebody can, again, um, just flow into any given situation and respond organically to what's happening in that situation without the need for a self-image of what kind of person they are, right? 
So um, some people worry, if I drop my self-image of being a good person, then, then there's no um, injunction to moral action. I might just become a, a, a horrible person who just does whatever they want and doesn't care about anyone else. And this objection betrays a, a deep, deep and shocking cynicism that implicitly <laughs> believes that humans are not uh, inherently good, that they are inherently um, horrible, you know? And so what I've, what I've seen is that um, when humans ha are carrying a lot of pain and woundedness, they can be horrible to each other, but that um, undamaged and or healed humans are not like that. That is to say, even without a self-image of what a good person is supposed to be like, people are drawn, not all of them, but a lot of them, the majority of them, all other things being equal, are drawn to acts of love and acts of compassion. So if you actually believe that the core of what you are, your essence nature is divine, then this is not going to be an objection that that concerns you because you know that without a self-image um you know love and compassion and desire to connect and support others and be supported by others is just what naturally arises so this is uh, a topic that i could talk about for a long time and maybe i should do a more in-depth teaching uh, this one is, you know, very much off the cuff and, and spontaneous um, because there's so many nuances to this particular issue that, that would need to be teased out. And by the way, if you want to put a question, those of you who are watching live, if you want to put a question or objection or comment in the, um, in the chat window, feel free to do that. So I've contemplated this a lot, and I, as far as I can tell, there is not a single human activity that we are better at by virtue of having a self-image, okay? Because there's basically two kinds of activities that we engage in. We engage in activities that are natural to us. I mean, I mean, to you as an individual, because let's remember, divine consciousness vibrates a little bit dif differently in each one of us. There is um, you know, it's one universal divine consciousness, but the way that it vibrates or dances through each one of us is a little bit different. So if we're talking about you in particular, there are activities and actions which are natural to you, and yet you have a self-image about them as well, right? This is sort of what I call wearing a mask of your true face you know, and a lot of people do that. We have these two different kinds of masks, masks that distort us and, and masks that are actually masks of our true face. So these self-images we think we need, but we don't, because if you drop the self-image, then you, what's revealed is the innate divine spontaneity of your essence nature dancing uh, through <laughs> this life. To, to put it one way, right? Or life dancing through you um, in the particular vibration of, of your unique essence nature. But we also engage in activities and actions that are not natural to us, meaning there are activities, actions, or careers in which we are trying to please someone else or which reflect the internalization of someone else's story about how we should be and who we should be. And sometimes we do this even when the people whose stories we've internalized are gone, are dead. You know, like there's a way in which we can go on still trying to please our, our parents or whoever, even when they're gone, some people. So it doesn't matter who, but when we look at, oh, I've internalized this story about who I should be that's not actually natural to me, when that type of self-image falls away, that will result in ceasing that particular mode or pattern of behavior because that pattern of behavior that was not natural to you is maintained by this artificially installed self-image and therefore it will fall away with the self-image but for most of you watching this video the majority of what you do probably 
is actually natural to you, but you don't get to experience of those activities because self-image carries with it an intrinsic sense of obligation, and obligation decreases intrinsic motivation, as psychology has shown. So do you see what I mean? Even though you're doing something that's natural to you, if you also think that you should do it, that you have to do it, that you have to maintain this self-image as the person who does this, then that can actually uh, drain away the natural joy of that activity, which you would still be doing without the self-image, but in a different way, with a, with a different um, attitude, if that makes sense. So that's why those people who are engaged in activities, behaviors, and careers that actually align with their essence nature, when they shed their self-images, nothing actually changes much in the external, what other people can see, right? They don't change their job or their relationship or whatever, but they're experiencing it in a whole new way. They're experiencing it as the spontaneous, ever fresh, intrinsic joy of being expressing through this particular activity with no sense of obligation, right? So um, we have internalized a story from our whole culture that obligation is necessary for us to fulfill our duty. But when we act out of a sense of obligation, we don't act from this deep source of joy and freedom within. And when we act out of a sense of obligation to others, we subtly and subconsciously resent them, even though it's our problem. <laughs> You're the one who has the sense of obligation. And yet, if you act out of that sense of obligation in your duty or dharma towards others, then there's a subconscious resentment that can build up. Right? So <laughs> the thing is that the vast, the vast majority of, to, to go back to the mother example, the vast majority of mothers uh, actually love their children. <laughs> and if you remove the kind of social obligation, they still care for their children. In fact, they care for their children better because they are going to be responding to what's real and what's arising moment to moment instead of responding to their mentally installed self-image of what a good mother looks like. I hope, I hope that makes sense, you know. So, um, uh, uh, of course, there are, there are some people who suffer from, from, say, mental illness, that if you remove that kind of obligation or injunction of duty, um, they do kind of then neglect whoever it is that's in their care. But this is a, you know, a, a small minority of, of cases. And uh, we won't get into that particular problem right now because it would take us in another direction. But hopefully you, you, you get what I'm saying, even if you don't <laughs> agree with all of the argument. Um, okay, so it's not so easy to deconstruct and release your self-images because many of them, again, are, are glued <laughs> together or bonded to the central sort of I story, the story of me, the autobiographical story, um, by some skadas or charged, uh, well, unresolved impressions of past experiences that uh, have emotional charge. So for those self-images, there needs to be some inner healing, for lack of a better term, uh, digestion, actually would be a better term, but not everybody is familiar with the, with the metaphysical usage of the term digestion. But healing or digestion of those unresolved past experiences is sometimes necessary for an associated self-image to fall away. So for example, if you have the self-image, I'm not good enough, that almost definitely got installed in childhood. And there may very well be a piece of childhood pain that needs to be digested or healed in order for that I'm not good enough um, self-image to fall away. So I don't want to gloss over that. It's not as simple as just kind of logically examining all your self-images, realizing, oh, that's just a thought. That's not me. I'm not a thought and letting it fall away. For some it is, right? A lot of our self-images are not tightly linked to 
um, some skaras, and you can just look at each one and say, actually, that's just a thought, and I am not a thought. I am the one who's aware that there is thoughts uh, or no thoughts, self-images or no self-images. So, and then it falls away and dissolves, sometimes piece by piece, sometimes all at once. But, again, many, many of them are going to need to be, um, you're going to need to do a little bit of deeper work um, that we might characterize as, as healing or digestion. Okay, so let's see what <laughs> questions or comments you have. Um, and I just want to, you know, signal that I'm not fully satisfied with how I explain this. I mean, it's, it's, it's good, but um, <laughs> I might make another video where I try to get even more precise. So let's see what uh, questions you have. Oh my gosh, there's so many I can't see them all. Okay, here we go. Um, Nilanti uh, in Melbourne says, I've always wondered how people would be in romantic relationships if there was no Hollywood or depictions of how true love is supposed to look. Yeah, I mean, we would expect who knows, right? Because that is one of the main areas of our deep, deep conditioning. What a husband, wife, boyfriend, girlfriend, partner is supposed to look like. What we're supposed to do for our partner, how we're supposed to be, how a man in relationship is supposed to be, how a woman in relationship is supposed to be. Huge, huge raft of conditioning um, that comes with these roles. And it's and it's radical and frightening to deconstruct that conditioning and to realize how much of what you assume about relationship is not embedded in reality itself, but is part of narratives that you have been internalizing for movies and stuff since you were a little kid, you know? So the important thing for on the path of awakening is that you are having conversations with the person that you're intimate with and getting your values explicitly and clearly on the table and not taking anything for granted because, uh, because you can't. I mean, the, the, the whole world of relationship is being deconstructed culturally as well as individually and being questioned in many, many ways. So you can't take anything for granted. You've got to um, get it on the table like, oh, this is what I want out of relationship, you know, and not phrase it in terms of like, See, because our subconscious really believes, oh, if you love me, you're going to do X, Y, or Z for me or for us. And that is part of this internalized narrative. So you've got to kind of do some work to get what is subconscious into the light, into consciousness and say, oh, wow, yeah, I do have this assumption that this is what it means to be in relationship and that if you're not doing this, partner, then you're not being a good partner. But you need to out those assumptions and call them what they are, which is values. This is what I want in relationship, which is different from saying this is how people should be in relationship. And if you're not conforming to that story, then you're doing it wrong. Right? We got <laughs> absolutely that that is not a workable paradigm for anyone on the path of awakening and probably not for anyone, period. Um, <laughs> I'm just laughing at some funny comments. Davey asks about ego death. Um, I'm not sure what people mean when they say ego death, but one, one possible version of that is when there's a kind of sudden awakening to the reality that you are not any of your stories about yourself. That's not actually ego death, but it's getting called ego death by some, right? Because it, it, there, there is this kind of temporary seeming implosion of the ego structure when you realize, oh my gosh, I am not any of my thoughts about myself. I'm not any of my stories about myself. I am some, uh, what I am is un, unspeakable, unstoryable. But 
you see it takes a, a, a lot of practice and abiding in, in, in awareness for that realization to become stabilized to, and, and abiding. So what in that context people are calling ego death is actually a, a temporary seeing through the ego, seeing through, through it, seeing its falsity, but the ego still has all these samskaras kind of embedded in it and which constitute its, its, its cohesiveness, its stickiness. And that work it still remains to be done. So what happens is the person thinks they've had an ego death and then it resurrects itself in a subtler form. I, I can speak from experience about this. It resurrects itself in a subtler form and you, it takes more work to catch it. Oh my gosh, it's the same damn self-image in a sneakier, subtler form. And you've got to get your discernment and awareness more and more and more refined to catch the subtler and subtler versions of the ego, which though they're subtler, are no less insidious. So the ego will continue to resurrect itself until it doesn't have enough fuel to resurrect itself with. And that can take a while. Um, fortunately, it does get weaker and flimsier <laughs> um, as time goes on, if you're really doing this, this inner work, okay? So um, it, it also can get subtler so, and sneakier, right? But if you're really doing the inner work, it's, it's getting weaker as well, and so um, eventually it doesn't have enough well, fuel, whatever the metaphor is, to resurrect itself. Um, Martin asks, so without an ego, you would always be in the moment, raw and super sensitive to life. Not necessarily. A lot of people experience being super sensitive um, as self-images fall away. It's a kind of experience of being open, raw, vulnerable, and sensitive. But that, but as the energy body strengthens, and this is something that's hard to talk about. We'll have to do another video on it. But because most people experience the illusion of a robust energy body through a robust ego, which is kind of like, you know, Iron Man, who's just a guy. I don't know, I haven't actually seen the movies, but I think he's just a guy who just, his massive iron suit makes him badass. And in the same way, a robust ego might make you look like you have a strong energy body. But a truly strong energy body is one that allows you to be present with reality as it arises moment to moment, including challenging and painful moments, without the need for self-image, self-images that interpose themselves between you and reality. So without the ego, there's much more intimacy with reality, or even with a partially um, elided ego, there's much more intimacy with reality. Uh, but that in time doesn't feel um, unbearable you know, because the strong energy body is not oversensitive. Um, Gareth's, Gareth uh, mentions Eckhart Tolle's use of the pain body. The pain body is nothing but the energy body which is not yet healed and strong. So uh, that's just a phrase he uses. I think it's a, a slightly unfortunate phrase because it implies that the energy body is, is inherently filled with pain, but it only is until it is not. But yeah, the, what he means by pain body is the unhealed energy body. Oh yeah, Jessica reminds me that in the title of the video, there's the word atavism. And this is, this is where the topic gets more complex. An atavism is an evolutionary adaptation that's no longer adaptive, okay? So, uh, for example, something talked about in evolutionary biology a lot is the fact that we evolved in tribal societies of about 150 people. And in the context of that tribe, you know, 100,000 years ago, you really needed to worry about what other people thought about you. Because if you didn't have the good opinion of, of the rest of the tribe, you run the risk of being outcast and ostracized, which would mean death. Couldn't survive without your tribe. So maintaining 
the good opinion of your fellow tribes people is a life or death matter. And this is cited in evolutionary biology as a good example of a psychological atavism. It was adaptive to worry about what other people thought of you. But now it's not, because now um, your, your survival is not dependent on whether other people uh, like you or whether any given subset, because there's, there's, there's tons of people in the world and we can find our own tribe where people have similar values because when people don't like you, it's usually just because their values are different from yours or yours are different from theirs. Not because you, you know, inherently suck as a human, though I suppose that, that, that's, that's possible in the case of, I don't know, a narcissist or psychopath. But most people are worrying about what other people uh, uh, think as a function of their evolutionary biology, not because it's actually um, a good strategy for being alive in the 21st century. And that's an oversimplification. There's a lot of depth uh, to that particular discussion. But I argue that the ego itself is an atavism in the sense of it was adaptive. It was adaptive to, for people to have an I concept. And uh, starting about two and a half thousand years ago, it became possible to then step beyond, go beyond um, that particular stage of evolution. Because each, remember, each human individual recapitulates the stages of evolution. A lot of this happens in the womb, where, you know, there's a stage at which you are very much like a tadpole, you know, and, um, and then you, and this is something that's, um, study has been well studied in biology you recapitulate the phases of evolution in a microcosmic form in the womb and even outside of the womb and that's why in a sane society i and other people argue um everyone would get over themselves would 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 transcend and then dissolve their ego sometime in their 20s right <laughs> the the frontal lobe um, finishes developing around age 24. By age 28, 29, um, if, if we are in a sane, enlightened society, you'd be ready to go beyond and then dissolve your ego, right? You, you transcend it first so you can see that you're not it, and then you uh, do the work of dissolving it. Um, so, you know, sane society, that would, uh, that would be everyone by the time they're 35, right? Just, just as a kind of um, way of thinking about it. So, ego as atavism, not in the sense that we could avoid developing it because each individual has to recapitulate the stages of evolution. So a teenager has to get self-conscious, of course. There's no way to raise a kid that they're not going to be self-conscious as a teenager and be like, oh my God, what do other people think of me? That's a necessary stage. So then they're going to go from immature ego to mature ego to no ego. Um, and <laughs> that, 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 possibility has been around for two and a half thousand years because that's that's the period of time that we have documented evidence of people going beyond and dissolving their egos um but it clearly has not happened to um more than a tiny 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 percentage of of, of humanity so if you buy the evolutionary argument then um it it more and more people are slowly <laughs> um accessing this possibility in human life. Um, Devashi says, <laughs> in, in the, mentions how in the 21st century, people need to market themselves online. How could this be compatible with being on the, on the, on the path of awakening? Easily, because you can play the marketing game as just playing a game. You don't actually have to believe it. <laughs> you know, I mean, that sounds like then, oh, then you're, then you're faking it. But, but every role, uh, unless you're, unless you're engaged in fully liberated, spontaneous expression of pure being moment to moment, every role that you're engaged in is, um, is somewhat artificial, right? The very definition of the unliberated state is a state of artificiality. We are playing roles um, until we're not, right? And just in the same way that you could, you could learn 
the ropes of a, of, a, of a corporate environment and play that game and do it as well as you can, just like you could play a game of chess as well as you can. And that doesn't necessarily mean being disingenuous unless, of course, the activities of that corporation are actually out of alignment with your values. But if they're not, then playing the game and trying to be good at playing the game is not necessarily fake or disingenuous any more than playing, playing a board game is and doing your best to win, even though there's nothing really at stake. Um, and that's the problem. We get, we get the idea that there's a lot at stake in playing these games, but they're actually, well, that's a whole other topic. Um, but yeah, so you don't have to believe your own publicity. You don't have to let your own publicity um, generate and maintain self images. I agree that it's a little bit challenging, but then so are, so are many things. <laughs> um, okay, this video is already long and we've barely scratched the surface, but I'll just look at a couple more questions. Sorry, I couldn't find my cool glasses. So I have these kind of cheesy glasses that are overly reflective. <laughs> um, I see a lot of people, Nilanti says, I see a lot of people, especially yoga and tantra teachers, promoting themselves on social media in a very manicured way to promote their work. On the one hand, it brings a wider variety of people to their work. On the other hand, it seems to be exactly the self-image trap. You can't tell by looking at anyone, though. You can't. I mean, I know it. that can seem hard to believe, but really, somebody could be just good at playing the game, and they could have more or less um, ego structure in place than anyone else. You just, you can't, you can't tell by, by looking at them. Okay, Ben has a long comment. I don't know if I have time for that. I mean, I guess there isn't actually a time limit on the on the video. I just have the idea in my head, a bit, a bit of cultural conditioning, that uh, these videos shouldn't be too long. Okay, Victoria says, aren't all self-images just a net of samskaras installed by parents, society, or even yourself? There's no such thing as individual essence nature. Your individual essence nature is pure consciousness. All the rest is fake. Even your own, even your swadharma is fake. Not exactly. Um, because, well, here's one simple way of talking about it. Look at the lives, the stories of the Mahasiddhas, the fully awakened, fully realized, fully liberated, embodied beings of this tradition. Even if those stories are not historically accurate, which I'm sure many of them are not, still they are making an important teaching point, which is that liberation, awakeness, realization expresses differently through different people. That is to say, notice that people who become liberated beings, awakened beings, they don't all look exactly the same. They don't all act exactly the same. There's, there's diversity of expression among awakened beings, right? So that tells us that even though there's, yeah, no such thing as individual essence nature, there's only the one, still the one expresses differently through everyone, even when you are free of self-image and free of the shackles of, of conditioning. So, that's what we mean. Not, not, don't reify the concept of individual essence nature. That's just a way of referring to the fact that the one uh, expresses um, with, with magnificent diversity in all these um, different forms. Okay, lots of interesting comments. The presence of long comments in the thread uh, is evidence of multitasking, by the way. <laughs> Some of you were typing thoughtful comments um, instead of listening. Not, not criticizing, just saying, you know, multitasking is, is um, 
not exactly the same as being fully present. But anyway, <laughs> we could argue about that another time, whether it's antithetical to, um, to yogic presence or not. Yes, lots of interesting comments. I won't be able to get to all of them. Maybe this, um, this comment thread can continue. Post video, people can keep commenting and responding to each other. Um, so Ben asks another version of the same question, but I do wanna highlight it just for a moment. How do we continue to function in a world that seemingly demands to engage with most people on a very shallow level of stories and labels. Yeah, but the thing is, <laughs> again, like an actor on stage um, does her best to play the role to the best of her ability without believing she is the character in the same way. If somebody asks, um, you know, asks for the superficial labels, please label yourself so I know how to relate to you. You can play that game. That doesn't require you to believe in the associated self images, right? So I, I experience this myself, not all the time, but some of the time. I experience myself as um, radiant no thingness, as nobody, right? Again, not all the time, I'm not claiming that. But when I'm experiencing myself to be the, to be, nobody, right? Um, nothing and nobody. And somebody then asks me to share something about myself, then whatever it is that can, it can spontaneously arise in that verbal expression that seems appropriate to the present moment without an actual identification with uh, uh, the words that are being spoken. Um, and the words that are being spoken, of course, bear some relationship to some truth. They, they bear relationship to the role that people perceive me to be in, let's say, right? But I don't actually have to, I don't even have to experience myself as the speaker in order to speak, right? Just like a musician or a dancer in, in the throes of, of creative ecstasy, as it were, <laughs> doesn't experience herself to be the doer, right? To be the, the they experience themselves to be the um, vehicle, if, if you see what I mean, the conduit. And in the same way, you can experience any action, and, and, and I can verify this from my direct experience, you can experience any action without needing to be the doer of that action, even speaking. Like in any given moment, you know, you, you can't tell the difference from outside, but like here are the words spontaneously arising, and I don't need to identify myself as the doer of this action of speaking. So this is part of the revelation that, you are not the thinker of the thoughts. You are not the speaker of the words. You are the space of awareness within which thoughts, words, and actions are arising. And you are the thoughts, words, and actions, but no more than you are everything else, because you are all the Shakti, right? So lastly, um, I want to mention that this is not just the province of spirituality anymore. There are incredibly rigorous scientists and philosophers out there who are not part of the spiritual tradition who are arguing exactly the same thing. And I'll give you a specific reference. Um, Thomas Metzinger is one of the most respected um, consciousness researchers in the world. And he's the head of the European Society for Consciousness Studies. He's based in um, Germany. And he, he, he argues exactly this, you know, that, that um, the I, the feeling of I, which is subconsciously linked to all the thoughts about I, is artificially maintained by those thoughts, and it is a cognitive illusion, right, that, 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 there, that, that anyone not just on a spiritual path, but through a profound process of self-reflection can come to see that when the I thought, when the I belief is not being maintained, um, it can temporarily vanish and eventually it could permanently vanish. But that I, the sense of I, uh, an autobiographical me at a particular moment in the autobiographical arc is actually a thought 
that and it's an energy consuming thought like all thoughts that are that are maintained and when it when it's not maintained it's gone when you try to find the i as an actual thing other than a thought you can't you can't find it anyway if you want to if you want to <laughs> um reflect on this in the context of neuroscience and consciousness studies then look at thomas metzinger's the ego tunnel look at uh, sam harris's waking up and then the other um the other works that those authors cite in their bibliographies okay because this is important if, if this is a fundamental truth of human life it, then it's not only accessible through spirituality it has to be accessible through other means and it is there are um you know, and yeah, <laughs> that's all I'll say about it for now, I guess. Um, This is a juicy topic. There are so many um, <laughs> juicy comments here. So yeah, the the This should not be confused, you guys, with the meditation on I in the tantric tradition, the meditation on aham. So there's a very important difference to be made here between ahamkara, self-image manufacturer, and the pure aham, which is taught in the recognition sutras, among other places, which is simply an immersive awareness in the feeling of being itself and the feeling that being is not impersonal you know that 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 presence is incredibly intimate i mean it's not personal either right because that that word has the wrong connotations but that uh, the meditation on a hum is not the mind asserting i exist i'm important it's actually letting go of all mental self-representation and sinking into this immersive state of being itself. So the vibration of intimate I-ness, not as a thought, not as a mental self-representation, but as the, as the distilled essence of the experience of being. And so that can lead one to eventually to the experience of unity consciousness, purnaham vimarsha, which means the I which is all-inclusive, the all-inclusive I awareness, um, meaning to say that, that what I am is everything, and everything is what I am, right? So that's a, that's a further on stage that we can talk about another time, but it is discussed in Recognition Sutras, especially chapter 20. Um, and when describing the goal of the path, the goal of practice, the ultimate realization is the all-inclusive I. So it's not um, an annihilation of the feeling of, of one's own existence, but the realization that one's own existence is all-inclusive. There's nothing that is not me. <laughs> there's nothing that is not God is the same thing as saying there's nothing that is not you in your real nature. Everything that appears is what you are appearing as that. Everything that appears is what you are appearing as that. But you can't have that realization, at least not in, in an abiding way, until you first learned how to sink down into the sort of depths of your own being and immersed in blissful aham consciousness, aham vimarsha. Okay. <laughs> Um, well, that's it for now. <laughs> nice to be with all of you. Thank you for your comments. Thank you for, uh, your engagement. And we can continue this discussion uh, in the thread on the, the published video. 
in the group. Om.